I'm delighted to say we're kicking off the show this morning with Conservative peer Lord Moylan, uh, a man who worked closely with Boris Johnson back in the days when he was Mayor of London, uh, and a man who knows a thing or about a thing or two about the Prime Minister. Lord Moylan, very good morning to you. Good morning. How are you, Mike? Very well indeed. Great to see you. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I mean, the first question really is, were you as be- uh, uh, dismayed um, and sort of besmirched as I was yesterday watching that briefing where literally we expected this big barnstorming performance for Boris Johnson to come out and tell us that everything was great and everything was moving forward. And instead, he made one of the shortest speeches I think he's ever made and then handed it over to uh, old Chris Whitty and his next slide projection. Yeah, well, he's being pulled in two directions. And I think that's why it's really important that people who do understand what normal life is keep making a noise and start pulling him back in the right direction, because I think that's really where his instincts lie. Um, We've got to have a clear idea of what normal life is and aim to get back to it. And and what the um, what what the uh, sage people and I'm not complaining now about medical people um, and doctors. I'm complaining about the statisticians and the modelers wouldn't know how to cure a boil on your bum. I mean, mm. they're, they're all mathematicians. Um, I'm complaining about them. And what they're doing is they're stoking up fears for the future and saying we must be ready to handle those things um, in advance. And there's a degree in which we to, to which we should be, but not to the extent of not getting back to normal. And you just imagine the huge database that has to exist of your uh, medical details, all kept in digital form on your phone. I mean, these are huge intrusions into personal liberty that people in this country are going to find many of them are going to find very very strange so what i'm saying is if, if you've got to go don't download the app and if you're going to go to a venue where they demand that you show the app tell them politely that you're taking your custom somewhere else yes and what do you say lord moylan to these people who are kind of um against our point of view if you like and i'm not saying that you and i share every single point of view but on this particular yeah. vaccine passport front what do you say to these people who say, what's wrong with you? You know, we have passports to travel abroad. We have all sorts of digital um, footprints all over the place. We've got a DVLA driving license. We have insurance. You know, I, I try to convince them that this is not the same thing. No, well, it, I don't think it is the same thing. And, and I don't mind having a, a vaccine passport for, for international travel. I'd rather it was a paper thing. I've had a paper document that says I've had my tetanus jab and my yellow fever and many of us have that because we've traveled abroad I mean mine's out of date now because I've been abroad <laughs> for so long well we but, you know, well, nobody um, has you know but 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 you don't mind doing something like that which do you have to show if if there is um, a reason to do so and I do think we might have to live with restrictions on international travel for a while until the rest of the world and the places where we want to go catch up with us in terms of vaccination But if vaccination is a success and if it means something, it means that a very large number of people cannot get ill with the virus, even if they ingest it in some way, Mm. they cannot get ill with the virus. So if you've been vaccinated, you really shouldn't need to worry too much any more than you worry about getting the common cold or getting the flu from people. And that's what I mean by normalization. We need to normalize the virus as well as normalize our own lives. We need to treat it as being something that does happen and people will get, but in numbers that can be coped with and which can be part of a rolling and improved vaccination programme, just as we do flu at the moment. And if I may say so, there's a lot of progress being made in that. We, we, are, fi- the, the, we, we are running the biggest clinical trials in the world in this country and we're discovering new drugs. We, dexamethasone was, is old hat now, but there have been other anti-inflammatory drugs that show that they help if people get um, get the virus and that they help with the treatment. This is a medical problem to be, found, to be handled with medical solutions, but we've handed it all over, the running of it's been all handed over to a bunch of mathematical geeks mm. who wouldn't know what they were doing medically. They're just running models, many of which have flawed assumptions in them. Well, this is it. I mean, I keep hearing different figures from them as well, because first it was Chris Whitty saying 30,000 extra people could die in the summer. That seems to have gone down to 16,000. Nobody's explained why that's happened. Uh, Also, of course, many of these people that you described are, in fact, behavioural scientists, which is basically, for me, shorthand for for con men, because these are people who supposedly predict people's behaviour, and when they get it wrong, uh, they don't seem to have any kind of uh, answer for that uh there are too many behavioral scientists around and i really don't think we need them at all uh, in fact i'm coming to the point of view that sage is now so worried about some public inquiry i think it's a great great mistake great danger to the country when 
uh, last year, people were demanding for political reasons, public inquiry and basically demanding heads, you know, people hanging from nooses um, uh, uh, over the handling of, of this virus, which was unprecedented, which nobody could actually get right. Mm. There's no right answer even now to what was the right date to lock down and so on when you take all the factors together. Um, and so what it's done, I think, is it's made SAGE and it's and, and many much of the, that sort of world um, far too nervous. And I think we're coming to the point where actually we should just say SAGE isn't helping anymore. No. We're saying do without medical advice, but the government doesn't need SAGE to have medical advice. It can internalise medical advice. It can have, it's got a chief medical officer after all. It doesn't need this bunch of people, these randoms wandering around from one television station to another, giving us contradictory right. opinions time yeah and it does need to focus on normality what that means and getting back to it cautiously i don't mind a bit of caution i don't mind if we're a bit slower than we need to be but we need to have the goal clearly in sight it doesn't include vaccine passports or massive test and trace with people being told to isolate and no compensation yeah. Exactly right. And why is it as well that many of these sage individuals go on television when they do and radio when they do and then claim to be speaking in, quotes a personal capacity, in which case, why are they even on? I don't even know why people get them on. I mean, I wouldn't have one on my show talking absolute and utter cobblers, pretending that there's some kind of data that they're following when there clearly isn't. And it's all being made up in a lab somewhere. Um, but also it struck me yesterday, uh, basically, that in the end, somebody was really um, pulling, as you say, in two different directions with Boris because he couldn't seemingly uh, confirm anything. He couldn't seemingly commit to anything. And I was very interested, and I know you've retweeted this piece from The Spectator this morning from Fraser Nelson about how he's talking about um, how carefully he said what was going to happen on Monday but wouldn't really go beyond that and then said that there would be no reason to provide certification uh, of a COVID status report in a pub garden. He did not say inside a pub. Yeah, well, look, it's right that the Prime Minister should listen to everybody before jumping to conclusions and making his mind up. And I think Boris will see us through this and bring us out on the other side. And I think that's where his instincts are. So I think we're, we're at a stage at the moment, clearly from yesterday's interview, where Boris hasn't quite made his mind up what he's doing. Mm. And, and I think he, but I, I, we need to keep the pressure up and ensure that he listens to all voices so that he comes down on the right side of this. Otherwise, if you if you live on facts, you can see a way forward. If you live on fears, which is what we're being told, oh, there might be a third wave, there might be a fourth wave, this might happen, that might happen. If you live on fears, you will never, ever get back to normal because you can never dispel or disprove the fears. Right. There's always going to be a reason down the road for not doing the right thing. Well, this is the trouble. I mean, I heard somebody this morning talking about what could happen, you know, if the virus came back in a stronger way, much stronger way than before. And you're kind of going, well, that's fine. But that's literally pie in the sky. There's no evidence for it. You know, we appear to be in no, a but very... You can, you can mitigate it. I mean, personally, rather than have vaccine passports, if you're really worried about a third wave or a fourth wave um, overwhelming the NHS, I'd say, OK, reopen the Nightingale hospitals employ a whole load of extra nurses mm. and doctors, have them standing around doing nothing, so you're ready for it. And at least then you'd have externalised and made clear what the cost of, of, of mitigating these fears was. Mm. And you might say, well, it'd be extremely stupid to have a load of doctors standing around and nurses standing around doing nothing. But that's the whole point. The whole point of saying you have to run the country according to NHS capacity is that, it, is that that is not a sensible thing to do. Mm. It well, isn't a sensible thing to do. Well, but I'd rather see that done than have everybody, you know, living in this state of constant fear um, and, 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 and that, that, that is really implied by vaccine passports. The other thing is, I don't think people will use them. Well, As I don't I think said. people people will. I mean, it will be similar to what happened in the test and trace scenario back in the summer of last year, where certain restaurants and certain bars were very kind of deliberate and uh, and were very draconian about who they let in and what details they got. Well, from not them. one I found. Um, well, most of the places I went to were not like that at all, because no. you know my my friends who run restaurants and run bars said Look, it's not our business to find out who's here if the government asks us to take a name we take a name it's nothing for us uh, as to whether that name's real or whether the phone number's right you know they're not they're not the police they're not going to do that are they yeah well there's a small number of sage epidemiologists you see who have for the whole of the last year been pinning everything not on vaccines but on 
test and trace because they th they thought they saw that working in South Korea and places like mm. that with totally different cultures operating in a different um, also at a different stage yeah. uh, in the pandemic. But test and trace only makes sense if it's accompanied by test, trace and isolate. And they never actually have explained how it is in a free country like ours, you are going to get mass compliance with isolation unless you have coercive measures. Mm. So unless you actually have the police and kind of, it's no good PHE ringing you up and saying, are you at home, darling? Yes. Um, you know, that, I mean, that, that, that might or might not work. I no. was in, the, and if you don't answer the phone, I was in the bath, I was in the shower, right. whatever. Who knows? You know, to make it work, you have to have coercive measures, which they do have in places like Hong Kong and mm. some Asian places. Measures which, if you explain them to the British people now, they'd say, well, we're not doing that. We're not putting up with all that. In Hong Kong, and I'm not criticizing them, this is their choice as to how to manage the pandemic. It's their country. It's not my country. In Hong Kong, you get a call. It could be in the middle of the night. They come round in a specially sanitized bus. They take you and your family off to a, a government-run hotel, and they keep you isolated for 10 days. Yeah. And it can happen to anybody. And it can happen at no notice at all. Keep you isolated. I think it's 10 days, might be two weeks, mm. because you're on a trace system which says you've been in proximity to something which they regard as, as a risk. And they've kept numbers very low. But that's the price you have to pay. That's the only way to make test, trace and isolate work properly. And I hope in this country that's for the birds. Well, I think it is. But also one of the criticisms of that system in this country as well is that many people were not compensated if they were supposed to be self-isolating. And therefore, and, and they, that, that, and, is, that is true, of course, as well. You have no incentive to isolate other than public spiritedness. And at the same time, many people do, who were asked to isolate were being told that the jobs they were doing were essential jobs. Yes, you know, exactly right. Essential workers. So what, what is it? Am I a central worker? What am I doing? Am I meant to give up my wage? But that's the point, you know. Not just poor people, not but, just people on low wages. So I guess the question, Lord Moylan, is how do we wrench Boris Johnson, the man that you knew when he was mayor of London, to be a very sort of go-getty kind of, um, you know, entrepreneurial style mayor uh, who made a lot of things work in London, who got a lot of things done and who was re-elected, despite the fact that the large proportion of voters in London probably would not vote Conservative as a general rule. How do we get that guy back? Because he's gone somewhere. Well, I don't think that's fair. I think we, I think we're getting back. There, are, there, well, there are two, two answers to that. First is, we keep telling him, so that he hears the voices from people saying, "This isn't the answer. That we've got to, we've got to be braver and bolder about this, and we can afford to be brave and bold because of your success with the vaccination program, which has made us a world leader. So we need to build on that, and he will understand that message." The, the cynical answer to that, of course, is that actually an awful lot of this could come down to Keir Starmer. Mm. Because in the end, um, if the Labour Party decides to vote for whatever the government is proposing, uh, when it comes to propose it, and we don't know what they're proposing in detail, or we don't know when they're going to propose it, but if it comes to a vote in the House of Commons and the Labour Party votes for it, then it will pass. And if the Labour Party doesn't vote for it, um, it is reasonable to think at the moment that it could fail. Mm. And Boris is perfectly aware of that. He can count. I mean, all politicians know how to count. Mm. And and he can count. And he knows, uh, you know, that's part of it. So a lot of this is going to come down. A lot of this pressure is really on Keir Starmer. I personally think, speaking entirely personally, that Boris would be quite thrilled if Keir Starmer came out against it. Yes, I think he probably would. The trouble is Keir Starmer hasn't seen a fence he doesn't want to sit on. And, I mean, every time he gets asked to make a decision... Well, about I, think anything... the Labour Party, I think his health secretary has been doing the rounds this morning, taking a rather firmer line than the leader did a couple of days ago. Mm. So maybe he's he's also moving in a certain direction. Yes, well, that would be good. But when you see headlines like this, uh, where we've apparently spent £2.8 billion for the UK's lateral flow COVID test from a Chinese businessman based in California, uh, who apparently originally is from Wuhan. You do wonder what on earth is going on. Why are we spending all this money on testing kits that are probably not going to work at all and, are, and, and, and as we know already, uh, are pretty unreliable? Well, I don't know how reliable they are. It worries me, however, I'm not commenting on that. They may be the most perfect and func perfectly functioning test kits. And if we need them, it doesn't really matter, in my view, where we get them from. 
Um, and uh, but well, what does worry me is that there are certain institutions where testing is now becoming um, the norm in a way that I think is going to be very, very difficult to lift in the future. Mm. Um, I worry about children in school being uh, tested repeatedly. Uh, people who go into schools, adults who go into schools, uh, are required to submit to tests as well. Um, I mean, legitimately going into school, like school governors, yeah. and people like that. Um, and, um, and, and that worries me. And it would worry me deeply if employers started requiring that. Yes. I'm told I, some, I think, some already have started to do it, but it is, yeah. it's a very slippery slope, as you say. Yeah, it's, it's a very slippery slope to uh, a two-tier society in which so much information and data is kept about you by people who simply can't be trusted to keep it secure, and that includes the government, mm. as we know, because no database is secure, however much they... Um, seek to make it so there are people who are adept at, uh, at getting into it yeah um, and and I think it's also mildly humiliating it's you know th th there has to be an adult life for adults and that means a degree of uh, independence and autonomy about what you do and with vaccination you know for the first time um, in a year we start to know that we can do as individuals what we want to do without greatly endangering others. Mm. So the argument for limiting our individual freedoms, which was that we endanger others in doing so, and it's irresponsible and wrong, that argument falls away the more effective the vaccination program is and the better the treatments become for people who develop COVID. So we need to hold that in mind. The whole mindset that we have to submit to these controls falls away as on the evidence when vaccination um, and better treatments uh, become available. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And just finally, Lord Moylan, this uh, uh, vaccine passport that they speak of is, as um, Fraser Nelson has said, not simply um, a vaccine passport. It's effectively a bio identity card. It's loaded yeah, with your personal that's... health data, which they can put any number of things on. Yeah, that, that's it, basically. That's it. It is your entire medical history. Mm. Um, and um, if it's if they're using the NHS app, of course, if they're inventing a new app, then it won't be ready until, you know, uh, for another couple of years and it never work. Mm. So that's a bit more. You sure it won't be world class like the last one? Um, it probably won't be world <laughs> class. No. Um, uh, what we've done many world class things in this country over the COVID with the vaccination. Uh, we are the lead world leaders in genomic sequencing, so we're the best at identifying mutant variants as they arise. And we've also run these massive um, trials, uh, random trials, that have produced validations of some drugs that help in treatment and, and also proven that some other drugs that people hoped would work haven't worked. So in some areas, Britain, which has a fantastic medical science reputation and skills in some ways britain has led the world but we're not the best at developing apps yet maybe no we're as certainly not booms but not yet no quite lord moylan pleasure to talk to you thank you very much indeed very much common sense coming from lord moylan conservative peer um a former um partner with boris johnson if you like in the running of london when he was mayor of london when he was a very much different individual to the one we saw yesterday